Yeah. 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 I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I can do it now. <laughs> there, there is a, there is a delay. All right. Thank you, Will. Corrected to the 2021 to 2022 foregone revenue. Okay. So, uh, Will, do we need a motion to make that change? It is changed. But... I don't think so. All right, sounds good.
Moving on, this is an action item. The consent calendar, Mr. Deuce. Mr. Mayor and Council, before us on the consent calendar for approval is our regular council meeting minutes of August 11th, 2021, and our regular and special bills as presented in the packet. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Hill. I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. Um, motion made. Second. All seconded. I think Steve beat you to the punch. Seconded by Stephen. Okay. Any further discussion? Chair, can you please take the roll? Michael Hill? Aye. Stephen Adams? Aye. Paula Loss? Aye. Daryl Ricker? Aye. Motion passes. No ceremonies or reports tonight. Uh, moving on to seven. Visitors' comments. This is an opportunity to address concerns not on the agenda. There is a three minute time limit. I would like to come forward. Going, going, gone. Uh, no world business tonight, so moving on. Nine, public hearings. Preliminary plat for Thayer Farms North. And if I had a guess, I would say it's, we start with Carrie, is that right? You may start with me, sure. Was well, that the plan? Yeah. Okay. Can I charge that? Yep. Okay. Okay, so this is a request for preliminary plat in the major subdivision uh, consisting of 146 single family residential lots on approximately 37.56 acres. Uh, the projects will be developed in phases, subject to market conditions, with public improvements and anticipated to start business at. Is, is there the any way we sound. can fix that? I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. What do we have? Oh, it's yeah. just a static feed. Oh. Go ahead. Keep going. Okay. So this proposed subdivision does not have an address at this point. It's generally located a half a mile northeast of the corner of the intersection of Lancaster and Greens Ferry Roads. Can you go to um, slide number four, please, Leon? You can see where it's circled there in purple. Um, it's just above the Thayer Farms project, which is currently under development. And it is just to the west of the um, Golden Spike planned unit development. This property is currently undeveloped and it is zoned R2. The proposed average lot size is 8,152 square feet in area, and the lots range between approximately 7,680 square feet is the smallest up to 11,943 square feet. The intent is to provide additional homes to meet the housing demand within the city in an area that's already developed with single family homes. This developer has committed to developing only single family homes, even though duplexes are allowed in this zoning, and to providing a $300 per building lot donation to the Lakeland School District uh, in order to help mitigate impacts. They will also be uh, constructing a hardscape fence, which will be installed. Um, along Rio Grande, um, I believe it's Avenue, Rio Grande Avenue, adjacent to the project, um, similar to the one that's currently located on Long Lancaster Road for the Bayer Farms development. They'll also be providing um, fencing, like solid vinyl or other, along the northern and western property boundaries of this project. The three, please. So, <clears throat> Uh, let's see, you can see here that um, where the project site is in the lower right hand corner, a little bit clearer. Um, again, the zoning is R2S, uh, slide five please. This is the future current future land use map. It shows the property is uh, land use designation as transformational. Residential use is compatible with this designation. Next slide. Here is the proposed uh, subdivision um, overlaid onto the property. Uh, again, you can see Lancaster Road there at the bottom. Um, Greens Ferry is running up the left-hand side. Next slide, please. Surrounding uses to the north, there are two private residences um, and a shop and storage lot for the Golden Spike Plan Unit Development. The two private residences are zoned agricultural at, in Kootenai County, and then the storage lot for Golden Spike is zoned R3 multifamily residential. 
to the east is the Golden Spike Planning Unit Development, which is R3 multifamily residential um, with a PUD overlay. To the south is the R1 single family residential neighborhood, the Fair Farms Planning plan Unit Development there. And between this development, this plan development, that is the um, undeveloped utility easement for the power lines and gas lines. To the west is undeveloped agricultural use um, in the ownership of Meyer. Um, and that's zoned both Cookie County Ag and also R2 single family resident in the city of Rathrum. Next slide, please. So this shows the uh, intended project phasing. They intend to phase starting on the south end of the development closest to Bayer Farms um, and then work their way up um, northward towards Nagel. Next slide, please. So the Planning and Zoning Commission did have a hearing to uh, consider this and they did determine that the preliminary plat is supported by the City Comprehensive <coughs> Land Use Plan and is or can be consistent with Rathbun City Code with minor revisions to plans. Um, those are just typical revisions that are noted by staff, um, things like maybe changing a signature block or something like that. Nothing that would substantively change the plans. Um, this proposed for the zoning use and lots, this proposed use is an outright permitted use in this zone district. This developer does have a vested right to be able to develop this property in accordance with the R2 zone district standards, which allow for both single family and duplex um, lots, subject to lot size and other standards. Lot size minimum is 7,500 square feet, and as discussed, it has been determined in the preliminary plat that all the lots meet that. Um, and again, the applicant has stated that the purpose of the development is for single, single family homes only. Uh, construction on the lots will be subject to individual building permits demonstrating compliance with zoning and development standards um, as found within city code at the time of development. And the provision of additional housing within the city is anticipated to help address the current housing market where residents are finding it increasingly challenging to find housing um, by providing additional available housing stock and housing options, it can help the market adjust over time. Additionally, um, additional housing stocks within the city are anticipated to help attract additional commercial and industrial businesses to the city, which provide for additional services and employment opportunities, which has been expressed often as a concern of the citizenry and has been identified through a comprehensive plan update process. Next slide, please. Access and transportation was also evaluated. When this was reviewed, reviewed by the city public works director, uh, city engineer for conformance with the city's transportation plan. It has been determined to be in keeping with that plan. Um, Idaho Department of Transportation, the two highway districts, and KMP on the Kootenai Metropolitan Planning Organization, Organization were also provided an opportunity to review the provide, proposal and provide comments. Um, they, none of those chose to do so. Um, the proposed access to the subdivision will primarily be, it's anticipated primarily from Rio Grande via Lancaster um, due to the type of road that Lancaster is and the width that it has. Secondary access is anticipated at lower volumes from Rio Grande via Nagel. Um, both the Lancaster Highway 41 and Nagel Road Highway 41 intersections will have fully actuated traffic lights installed as part of the Highway 41 expansion that's occurring now. And these should be installed prior to fall of next year, which should be well before um, most of the re any residential building that would occur within this plot. Um, the section of Rio Grande within the Thayer Farms development to the south <coughs> is being constructed as part of the Thayer Farms third edition construction improvements or bonded appropriately. Um, and that section of Rio Grande connecting to Nagel Lane northerly is completed with this development, the Thayer Farms North, um, with the eastern half to be constructed or funded by the developers of the Golden Spike development. And that was an agreement that was um, provided at the time that they developed um, their PUD. Next slide, please. 
you can see here that within the existing Golden Spike development, <coughs> there's one street, West Yosemite Street, that extends through to the western boundary of their property. Um, it's highlighted here in yellow. Um, the developer of the Thayer Farms North developer does not intend to utilize that, that connection um, or provide any access to the building site unless it's otherwise required. It could be required for the, by the fire department for emergency access or something like that. If that's the case, then there may be an opportunity to provide a gate with a knox box or some other alternative. So this project is not anticipated to generate any traffic through um, Golden Spike development whatsoever. Period. Yes. Is um, Yosemite currently fenced? I I believe that there's yes. a fence all the way down yes. that property line. Yeah. Thank you. There's a pedestrian gate, but the street part is, gate, is gated. Yep. And so it was, it's typical as with all developments within Rathrum that um, we require developments to provide connectivity for future uses that are beyond their um, planned development. So that was consistent at the time that it was developed with that requirement. Next slide, please. So you can see here the primary, um, on this slide, of the the primary access, again, is anticipated from Lancaster, which is an arterial um, up through Golden Spike, which will be a major collector. It's very wide, um, and that should provide the primary access to this. There will also be access provided um, from Nagel, which is to the north, and that's labeled collector, shown in blue. Um, and again, that little yellow, um, extension of Yosemite is shown there and as you see that will connect at least surfacing to Rio Grande but there's no street extension there there's a lot there so it, it's not it wouldn't go through um, during the planning and zoning commission hearing for this proposal there were um, some concerns brought up by the commission about the additional traffic that the subject division might create um, at Betty Keeper Grade School. You can see it there in the upper right. Uh, the commission did ask the applicant if they would consider placing a lighted crosswalk signal for that area. Um, the developer replied that they would be willing to meet with city staff to discuss um, options. However, it has not been determined at this time if those improvements are warranted or necessary. Um, there is a development agreement that's still required for this project. Um, and at that time, um, the city engineer can look at some of these things and add those offsite improvements if he believes they're warranted. Um, and again, the developer did say that they were had a willingness to meet with city staff to discuss potential offsite improvements. Next slide, please. Um, no other necessary offsite improvements were identified um, that I know of that can't be addressed through the traffic impact fees, and those are paid, of course, at the time of building permitting on the individual lots within the approved subdivision. Um, traffic impact fees are used um, to mitigate and offset impacts of additional traffic on our entire system within the city. So that's above and beyond those uh, road improvements that the developer is required to make um, and dedicate to the city as part of the development themselves. So for utilities and services, again, the services availability and capacity were reviewed by the city public works director, city engineer, for conformance with all of the city's adopted plans and standards. So we have our um, water and wastewater master plans. We have our, um, we have where we identify the expenditures for them and other plans of that sort. And it was determined that the proposed development can be accommodated by the sur city services. Um, as an example, the annual city of Post Falls Water Reclamation Division Wastewater Discharge Capacity Analysis, which was provided in Exhibit F of the staff report, provided determination, helped us uh, make a determination that there is capacity to provide for the proposed development. Um, the developer will be required to pay for and build Again, all of the utilities, streets, etc., necessary to serve the development. 
um, including but not limited to extending center city water and sewer mains to the property. Um, and there are also um, fees for those to be paid at the time of development for the capital improvements um, for system-wide improvements. Um, other services such as parks and police will also be addressed through those uh, impact fees. Um, so at the time of development, the fees are utilized again by the city to mitigate the impacts of additional housing and residents on city services to keep the burden on existing taxpayers low. Next slide, please. So um, as always, I did provide an extensive analysis um, through a matrix for Rathbone City Code and comprehensive plan consistency. Uh, and it was determined that um, the project, the proposal is consistent with the code and the comprehensive plan. Um, we did receive comments from uh, some agencies that were included within Exhibit E of the packet, um, as well as some written comments that were provided by the public. Um, during the planning and zoning public hearing, we also, they also received um, verbal comments from the public, and those were included in your staff report, a summary, as, as they were shown in within the minutes from the PNZ meeting. Um, and all of those comments and testimony were considered during um, the commission's consideration of this proposal. Um, we did receive some additional comments um, since the time of the planning and zoning hearing. I believe two of them were included within the Exhibit E in the staff report <coughs> um, at the bottom. Um, and those were both in favor of the proposal and then we sent Monday an email that included some additional ones that were received after the staff report was already sent. Um, and those are available. <clears throat> We'd like to enter them into the record now. Um, and those were all favorable as well. So the Planning and Zoning Commission did consider all the re relevant evidence, um, all the code, uh, comprehensive plan, et cetera. Next slide, please. And they do recommend approval <coughs> of the proposed preliminary plat. The commission also recommended as part of their motion that construction of Rio Grande Avenue um, to the north <coughs> up to Naval, Naval Road should occur after the first phase of the housing is developed. Um, and again, that's kind of a timing issue um, as far as uh, what the fire district may require, that kind of thing. Um, so I have included proposed findings of fact, conclusions of law, and conditions of approval within the staff report to address their recommendations along with other items that were discussed um, with the commission. For example, the um, traffic uh, signal uh, by Betty Kiefer. And that is my report. Do you have any questions for me, Mr. Mayor? And this Council? was, excuse me, posted and published? Yes. <laughs> Yes, it was. Mr. Deuce, do you have something to add to that? Mr. Mayor and Council, normally a preliminary plat does not come in front of the City Council as a public hearing. Um, it comes as an action item, as we had at the last City Council meeting. Uh, there was some current concerns that were addressed at the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission meeting that it was not posted <coughs> properly. Um, I wanted to let you know what those were. Um, one, this property does not have public access to it yet because Rio Grande has not been built. And so originally at the Planning and Zoning Commission, we posted this on uh, Lancaster Road, which is an adjoining property under the same ownership. Um, it was not posted on the site. And the other concern was that there were individuals that live within the 300 foot notice requirement that did not receive a U.S. mail document because when a title report is pulled on land on ownership it only came up with golden spikes. So as a recommendation of council, Mr. Harrington said that it would be best if we move this to the city council and have a public hearing on it and make sure that all of those notices and everything was posted accordingly. So we had two postings note on the south 
east corner and northeast corner of the property as well as the Lancaster uh, location. So we had three notices put in the ground, so to speak. Um, and then every resident within 300 feet was mailed a uh, letter by U.S. Mail notice, notifying them of the public hearing. So all of those things were addressed as well so that we would have it properly noticed. And that is why you're seeing a public hearing on a preliminary plat in front of the City Council. Okay, thank you. Any questions, Council? Maybe just, I'm sorry, Mr. Hill? Curiosity. Um, you mentioned that when you pull addresses from the, the title company, uh, I'm just curious, how does that work with rentals? Rentals are not property owners. So they don't receive public notification, they don't have an opportunity to weigh in on Not by state law, well they have an opportunity to weigh in, mind you. So by state law and by city law, it's property owners. Um, so rentals, no. Um, but we still publish it in the newspaper, we still put it on our website, we still send out other notifications. So state law generally requires that we post it in the newspaper, we send out a mailing and we post it on the property. So that's what we've done. In addition to that, we also have a portion of our website that has public notices on it that anybody can go to. We have an email program that people can sign up for all these public notifications for uh, public hearing. And we just instigated starting last week our text feature that's on our website that people can go to and sign up for public notices and then when we have a public notice of a hearing then we send it out via text message now. Now that is so new that there was only four people including myself that had signed up for that one. Not for this meeting by the way, it was for another public hearing in the future because this public hearing was posted 15 days ago and we didn't have that feature available. We also post in the kiosk out front. Yeah. So there's other opportunities for people to get notified of the public hearing and then it's open for everybody as they look at the agenda that we have a public hearing. So if you're a rental or a renter, then you still have the opportunity to come in and, and speak or submit comments. You just want to receive notification of the... You won't get something in the mail. Okay. And, and it's was set up years ago when you could track by tax records who own the property and notify them. But with renters, they come and go. And it's, it's impossible for anybody to... Keep and a lot of property out. owners for the rental things, they get noticed, but that... So that lot gets noticed, mm -hmm. but it's usually sent to the owner of the property, which could be, you know, in Rathroom, could be in Coeur d'Alene, it could be anywhere. Yeah. There, is, uh, there is a summary of um, all the postings and um, technical information um, in compliance with Rathbone City Code 12315 and 12316 that is included in the analysis um, within the exhibits. Okay, so that's your presentation. So next on the list would be the applicants. Just a brief question. Go ahead. Uh, Carrie. Can you explain to me what a hardscape fence, hardscape fence is? So it's the um, it's rock or typically the you know the landscape. Is it rocks? rocks? Like what's around? Did yeah, you yeah, see the one that's on Lancaster? I have not. <coughs> okay, okay. It, it, it's round up. like that radiant, uh, radiant lake. lake. Yeah, that's yeah. What okay, that is. it's a brick fence. So block fence. Okay. Thank you. So that was our opening presentation from the staff. I have one more question. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. The, that, you said fencing to the north. Does that include uh, fencing to block that um, future road um, onto the, the uh, adjacent property? Um, they they can fence it that now. Um, I I would assume that they would until there's some way to go through it. They'll have to put up barriers and stuff at the end of that road <clears throat> anyway. There was a letter from I believe that property owner expressed concern about uh, a roadway dead ending kind of like what you see um, on the neighborhood that's adjacent to the future Raptor City Hall site mm -hmm. yep. there's a roadway that's there that's got road closed signs but everybody rides their dirt bikes four wheelers walks their dogs um, dumps trash tires um, all kinds of things like that and those are some concerns that that property owner seem to 
um, to have. Yeah, so the, um, what the applicant stated during the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting was that they would be fencing the length of their western and northern property boundaries. So that would include those road extensions. <coughs> and in a minute or two, they'll be up here and we can ask them. Uh, so, once again, that was a presentation by staff. Uh, the applicant will come up and take their turn explaining to us why this is a good project. And, and then we'll open it up for the public and you will have a chance to talk for this uh, development neutrally about the development or against the development and then the applicant will have a chance if necessary to rebut any of that so what is helpful is things that are directly about this property uh, once in a while we hear this is a good guy they're a great guy oh they're but it doesn't go with that because the land can be sold tomorrow we're dealing with a piece of property not people so try to stay when you talk uh, relevant to the uh, development. Drew? Drew. Mr. Mayor, fellow council member, Drew Dittman, Lake City Engineering, 126 East Poplar Avenue, the city of Coeur d'Alene, for the record. Yeah, I just gave that speak really loud. So, <laughs> not a problem. Uh, Leanne's trying to pull up my presentation. Representing Big Creek Land Company tonight, uh, Cliff Mort. I think most of you guys know who Cliff is and see him. He, he did do the project to the south there, the Bayer Farms project. Uh, Cliff, I think, might get up here uh, and, and answer some questions or speak in a minute. Let's see if this works. Voila. So, uh, Bayer Farms North, as you can see there, is just north of the Bayer Farms project. Uh, I'm going to so, uh, but it is at the extension of Rio Grande Avenue, as Carrie had indicated. Um, Rio Grande does run along the eastern boundary of the Thayer Farms project. Uh, it currently is a half right of way, but there's no street built in it. That half right of way was dedicated with the Golden Spike project, and I believe the city has some, some funds in place for that. I'll talk about that in a minute. It's about 37 and a half acres. It's currently zoned R2. Uh, it has been zoned R2, and I have a correction here because I believe the staff report had a typo in it as well, and I didn't check it and do it. Uh, but according to your fancy historical annexation map over there, and according to my recollection, this property was annexed in 1998, not 1993. Um, I know that because it was one of the very first projects I worked on when I graduated college. So it has been in the city for a long time. It was annexed and zoned as R2 property back then. I guess to me that would make it an infill project. It's not a new annexation. It's been zoned R2 for a long time uh, and ready to be developed. You can see it's surrounded by residential property. You have the Golden Spike there to the uh, east in, in red, which is R3. You have the Thayer Farms original phase, which was a PUD plan unit development that we brought in, which was zoned R1. So the R2 fits, or the R2 zoning seems to fit naturally there. Uh, here is a copy of the preliminary plat, and again, I apologize, you have to kind of turn your head sideways because north is to the left in this circumstance. So you can see Rio Grande is on the top of the subdivision there. Um, and I guess I'll talk a little bit about Rio Grande. Uh, the Golden Spikes subdivision actually posted a bond with the city that the city is currently holding to construct their portions of Rio Grande. It didn't make sense at that time for the city to build it because it didn't serve anything. So the city is currently holding that bond. We have met with uh, Carrie and Kevin and staff about getting together and building that road as one with this project. As a matter of fact, in the recent weeks, the engineer uh, for that Golden Spikes has reached out to us and we've communicated and, and shared notes on how do we get Rio Grande built from Nagel back to the original Fair Farms with our project as one complete whole road that makes sense to do. We're willing to do that. We talked about that at the planning and zoning meeting and it's in, it's in the uh, minutes from that meeting. 
uh, it's the right thing to do. We're going to work with them. We'll work with, with Kevin and your uh, city engineer, your public works director, and, and, and see if we can make that, make that happen. Um, again, it's 146 single family lots. It is R2 zoning, as Terry had indicated, which does allow for duplexes. We are not proposing duplexes. We are limiting this to single family only, and that's in the conditions of approval, if I'm not mistaken. Um, all of the lot sizes that we have proposed do meet the zoning criteria, so we're not asking for any exceptions nor variances. Um, we have met with the school district ahead of time and have voluntarily agreed to donate $300 per lot to the Lakeland School District uh, uh, as this plat is developed. Even though that's not a requirement, we've agreed to donate that. Um, I did talk about Rio Grande. Uh, sewer and water is available. It's adjacent to the recently done uh, sewer and water trunk lines that have run through that property that go to the new lift station over there. Uh, so there is currently sewer and water available to the site. We will extend all the remaining infrastructure internally to make sure that everything is looped accordingly and is done for city standards. Uh, fencing, the fencing, uh, and this is brought up in the, in the P&Z meeting as well, but it'll be very similar to if not identical to what we did in the original Thayer Farms uh, project. You see some of that CMU block wall, whatever you want to call it. We also did a mix of some vinyl fencing in there. So you'll see that same combination of fencing continued. Um, make it easy. So I've now located it so it faces north like it should. So Rio Grande is on the east. Um, the two stub streets that adjoin the uh, neighboring properties uh, I had some extensive conversations with your city engineer during the development of this. You have caveats in your city code that require what we in the development business call to and through, where we have to provide connectivity to adjacent landowners so they don't become landlocked. So um, those are not only proposed, but according to what Kevin and I discussed, probably required by your city code to provide connectivity to the future future lands, even though those lands aren't developed at this time or there's not plans for them, your code requires that we provide connection to them so that in the future they could develop. Now, we will fence across those ends of those streets, uh, as you had brought up, so people don't go through there. We'll have to work with Kevin because we're going to be required from a transportation traffic standpoint to put signage and barricades up there and, and you know all the public good stuff that we do, but we'll work with with uh, the staff on that and make sure that that gets done to your satisfaction. We have reviewed the, the findings and fact and conditions of approval that were in Kerry's staff report. I don't think we take any exception to any of those. Uh, again, it's a fairly straightforward subdivision in, in, in our mind, so it will answer questions if there are any more. Tell them some questions. Yes, Mayor. Yes, Mr. Hill. Again, in this uh, project, there is a letter from, uh, or a memo that is addressed to Kevin Jump regarding the sewer capacity of uh, post falls reaching an 80% um, threshold. It looks like it's just a copy paste. It looks like the exact same letter. It's the same one. We get those once a year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's the same document that's being included. Yeah. To me, that again speaks to it's it's not saying we're at eighty percent capacity. Yeah, it's not. It's saying that we're we're approaching that. We're we're um, at a rate of uh, zero point four seven million gallons per year increase is, is the average growth. And I believe that's not just Raptor. That's Raptor man. That's all combined. All combined. Um, and that we're with that calculation, we're within two years of. No, no. Exceeding the 80%. We shouldn't be within two years of exceeding that because the next fall there will be a $1.5 million capacity increase that will be there. At the current rate um, and at the current capacity, we're within two years of exceeding what is, what is the current What is rate. currently there. Okay. However, the $1.5 million is already it in construction. That's not dollars, it's gallons. gallons. That's yeah. gallons. Yeah, and that's currently under construction right now, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is. And okay. if I'm recalling... So it's not a uh, pie in the sky, maybe it'll happen type of thing. It's already started. Okay. And we're currently, if I'm not mistaken, that letter said we're at 63%. 68%. capacity. So we're not at that 80. They are currently upgrading the plant. That's been in the works for a long time. Uh, and as Leon said, we get that letter. It's been in 
it was in the Brookshire project when we bought it a couple weeks ago, whenever that was. It's the same. Oh, it plate. But yeah, I didn't want to say board plate, but it's the same. Thank you. Letter and I might board. add that the next increase of capacity, in addition to the 1.5 million, is already planned and staged. So they that's. Post Falls Sewer did a long-term planning study in when they would need to adopt it. And that's why we saw rate increases of 9%, uh, 7%, and so forth down there. This was about six years ago that that started up. And that's because they were using those fees to prepare for the increase of capacity on these projects. So the funding was received, it, it started the construction of 1.5 million, and the funding is currently being received on ongoing projects so that it will also have the funding when it comes time for the next phase of increase of capacity. <coughs> now it might be important to point out that when Post Falls purchased the land that they bought for the sewer treatment facility, they purchased land that was estimated at that particular time to provide sewer capacity for the entire Rathroom Prairie. Not saying that the entire Rathroom Prairie would be developed, but that it would be easier to buy land to cover that than it would be to say, oh, we need to build a secondary sewer treatment facility and so that they went through a long-term planning to figure out how much land they were going to need and how many times they need to increase capacity and what the rates would need to be to do that. And a lot of that increased capacity comes from cap fees that are paid for at the time of building permit of these uh, houses. And those cap fees go up pretty much every year. You'll see that in our uh, fee increase schedule for this um, uh, next hearing. And then um, there's also increased rates to be able to meet the DEQ standards and other standards that have been raised as population increases. There would be higher standards that would be put on us. And then also creating funding for uh, land application and things like that. So it's thoroughly thought out and prepared so that the funding would be available when those different things needs arise. Anything else for me? Drew, yes. that's your presentation? It is. I have you have a question? Sure. Um, who is going to pay for and build the western half of Rio Grande between Nago and your property line? That is already bonded for by the Golden Spike. So they bonded. Well, for Golden Spike is, has the eastern half. They bonded for the eastern half adjacent to our property. They bonded for the full width north of our property because they own both sides of the road. Okay. Their stormwater treatment is on the eastern half. So north of us, the bond that you have is for the full width improvements. Adjacent to us, it's for half width improvements. Okay. And I guess our goal is to build the whole road all the way up to Nagel. And that's your presentation. I think so. Thank you, sir. <laughs> You'll get another chance. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, may, may I add just for clarification on those uh, Rio Grande things? The the PUD that uh, they are uh, not there, sorry, uh, Golden Spikes did included both north and south of Nagel Road. And the trigger to build Rio Grande was when they started to build development north of Nagel Road. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a division between what is now Golden Spikes and Diamond Spikes, and the city council reviewed that and had to mm -hmm. amend the Golden Spikes PUD to take out the northern section, which is now Diamond Spikes. And with that, the trigger was going to be lost in that whole process because Golden Spikes would never start development to the north. In the amendment of the PUD for Golden Spikes, they were required to bond for the full north section of Rio Grande and the east section of Rio Grande all the way down to the end of their property and that 
the trigger point for that to be developed was any development to the north, west, or south of that area would be a trigger point for the Rio Grande to be built. Um, we have had development already to the south, so the trigger point of that amended PUD has already transpired. <coughs> this is just an opportunity for two different entities to work together to keep the prices down on creating that Rio Grande Road. Any more questions? You're welcome for me pointing that out to you. <laughs> All right. Uh, those who would like to come forward and speak in favor <coughs> of this development. Seeing none, we'll move on. And oh, excuse me, Sherry, did we collect any written that were in favor? Not in favor. No. Okay. You can hold them there, Leon can read it or what you read it. Okay. When we get to it. Is there what, anyone who would like to speak neutrally about this development? Mr. Mayor, point of order, the, um, the letters that were sent in and forwarded to us on Monday, do those need to be read into the record so that then the public has an opportunity to um, be aware of their contents? We can, for sure. I have them available. I'm just asking procedurally if that's appropriate. We never have, but it, there's only a few of them, so. Yeah. If you'd like, I could read these in for you. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. All right. Um, first one, Winter Cunningham. It's good morning. I am unable to attend the City Hall meeting tomorrow in which the Thayer Farms North subdivision will be discussed. My vote would be in favor of the development. I think it would be great for the Rathdrum area. There is a need for housing in the region due to a large increase of people moving here. It would give people a chance to branch out of the Coeur d'Alene Hayden area and get into a different part of the region. Rathrum is going to boom with a new highway and it would be great to have more housing for when it does. Thank you, Winter Cuttingham, resident of Hayden, Idaho. Um, the uh, next- Excuse me, Leo. Yes. Would it be appropriate for him to also read the professional association of the person submitting the letter? Uh, I'm sure it would be appropriate or allowed, but um, I'm sure that this ends up in the record. You guys have all had access to it. You should be able to make a decision. This is basically so the people sitting here can hear who's the fours, I guess, because I think most of these are four. Could I give my opinion of the people who submitted these? How about if you do it when they're done reading? And, and may I caution you, Stephen, that we wouldn't do that on any other person that came up because they wouldn't okay. state what their profession is. Okay. Um, Angela, uh, Angela Erickson, I am writing in support of a 146 lot subdivision named Thayer Farms North. I have reviewed this proposed location and believe that it this appears to be a natural infill area for a subdivision of this nature. Responsible subdivisions like this one, which are adhering to all zoning requirements, should be encouraged. Adding additional inventory in appropriate areas could help slow the rate of inf inflated home prices that are outpacing our wages and help the City of Rathrum with additional tax base income to help fund the services needed for the face of this extreme growth Thanks for your time, Angela Erickson uh, from Court Lane. Uh, Wade Jacklin, dear council members, I am writing in favor of the approval of Thayer Farms North Subdivision. This is a great infill project for the city of Rathrum and will do well to assist the lack of housing inventory for our community. Big Creek Land Company monogram and Monogram Homes are respected and high quality entities that have proven over their many years that they do their best to ensure a high quality product. This product will help continue the proper growth of Rathrum with a neighborhood that we can all be proud of for years to come. Wade Jacklin, 3764 East Nettleton Gulch Road, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Duff, Duffy Smock, 
Hi, Carrie. Please find this email as my support of Big Creek Land Company, Stayer Farms North 146 lot subdivision being considered at the City Council meeting on August 25th. This is a natural extension of an established neighborhood and will offer future inventory relief from an already burdened marketplace. Should this neighborhood be developed, the increased inventory will bring it will bring will reduce the escalating pricing pressure on home buyers in our community. Allowing more inventory and in turn a reduction of pricing pressure may also give families current renting and purchasing opportunity. I fully support this Thayer Farms neighborhood. Thank you, Duffy and Jennifer Smock, 867 West Prairie Avenue, Hayden, Hayden Idaho. Sean Anderson, hello, I am writing to support the new development called Thayer Farms North in Rathrum. We need more developments like this so that we can provide affordable housing for local residents that does not happen by limiting development or building. Thank you, Sean Anderson. Uh, Charlie Renz, I recommend approval of the Thayer Farm project. Thank you, Charlie Renz. <coughs> and that is the end of those. Okay, now there were other written, but they came in earlier and they were already part of the record. These are with Wild Magnum, but part of the record. Ordinarily, I would ask that it didn't become repetitive, but those were all pretty short. And, very little and I would have hated to have tried to shorten them. <laughs> out of the repetitive. I'm sure I would have got you in trouble. All right, uh, seeing no others that want to speak for, would anyone like to speak neutral? I think I've asked that. Anyone against? this development. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Michael Fox, 13403 North Grand Canyon. Um, I, as I stated playing zoning, I'm not really opposed to the subdivision of the project. Uh, I don't think it's needed at this time. I think the Thayer Farms project right now has I, hard to tell how many lots are still available to build down there and I see no reason to start another project here uh, when he hadn't even filled out the first one. Um, the, the cost to the people in Rathrum are going up because of this growth and nobody seems to want to even talk about it. Um, the sewer fee. I, I don't know why that's a fee that's added when we have development impact fees and Post Falls is increasing the capacity. Why is that a fee to the customer? Why don't we use the development impact fees to pay for that capacity increase? If it's a fixed cost, it's not a it's not an operating cost, it's a fixed cost to add that capacity. It would be if Rathen was doing it or whoever was doing it, it should be a development fee and not a fee added onto the monthly fee of every customer in Rathen. We've got people in Golden Spikes, they can't afford $9 more a month, 15% increase. They're on a fixed income, every penny is accounted for. Now we're talking about a fire district increase. And we are property tax payers in Golden Spike. We own property and we pay property taxes at those addresses. <clears throat> so these costs are going up. And we're being told that our emergency response times, our fire response times, are 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 suffering because of the growth, but yet nothing's ever done except they want to come in with a permanent operating levy to increase the cost for everybody. Grantham has a sub has a subdivision ordinance. Now, this is subdivision, not building. Not which we're not talking impact fees or development impact fees or capacity fees or anything else. <clears throat> it has a subdivision ordinance. And the state law, the state land use law that authorizes that subdivision ordinance for Rathrum also says that each ordinance may, <clears throat> may provide for mitigation of the effects of subdivision of development on the ability of political subdivisions of a state, including school districts, to deliver services without compromising quality of service delivery, delivery <coughs> excuse me, to current residents or imposing substantial additional costs upon current residents to accommodate the proposed subdivision. I, I just don't understand. Why does Rathrum not have that provision in the subdivision ordinance? 
It's allowed by law. It's what everybody is complaining about is that the developers are not paying their fair share. But Rathman just wants to totally ignore the law. So if, if nothing else, I'm not, I'm not a no-growther. I'm not saying stop this development. I'm saying slow it down until things can catch up with it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll move forward. Uh, Mr. Uh, or Mr. Drew, do you have uh, something you would like to rebut there? Good evening, Mayor, Council. Again, Drew Dittman with Lake City Engineering. Um, I'll address some of Mr. Fox's comments. Uh, he said that not sure how many lots are available in the original Thayer Farms project. I can tell you there are none. We are out of lots. We are sold out through this phase to the next phase. That's why we're moving forward with this project. We don't have any lots available. Um, emergency services, I believe there's a letter in the file from Northern Lakes uh, Fire Protection District. They've reviewed the project and they've submitted a letter that's, uh, it, it should be in your packet. Um, as it relates to the subdivision ordinance, and, and Liam can jump in here and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, development does pay for itself. We pay impact fees. And with this one, we've offered to pay the school a $300 voluntary fee that, that, that is not required. We've met with the school district ahead of time, talked about that, and agreed on, on that number. Um, and, and I just I want to point out, and not picking on Rathrum in any way, shape, or form, but Rathrum has the highest building permit in Kootenai County, if I'm not mistaken. That's higher than the Post Falls, higher than Coeur Lane, higher than the City of Hayden. So, we are paying it in the development community uh, to, to support that. Um, we pay a lot of money in impact fees, park impact fees, sewer impact fees, uh, transportation impact fees, land, and tell you the numbers, I don't know what they are off the top of my head. Um, but, it, but it is a lot of money that developers do pay. We're also building a lot of infrastructure. Uh, you go back to the original Thayer Farms, we built parks, we built the pickleball courts, we, we donated mm -hmm. land. So uh, we do pay, in our opinion, we do pay our fair share. We think we're doing right by the community. We think we're doing right by the people of Rathrum. I don't know if Cliff had anything more to add or if you had additional questions for me. Mr. Ward? I have any questions if I may actually speak. Council, do you have any questions? No, I think you did a good job. Thank you for your time. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Terry, would you like to add anything? May I interject really quickly? I would just like to um, go ahead and on the record make those correction, make the correction to the staff report. On page two under um, zoning, changing the date of 1993 to 1998. Sorry. Thank you for pointing it out. There's also another correction on page nine under potential motions denial. I would like to remove the words Westwood Pines from the staff report. Template error. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so public portion of the course is closed. Uh, rebuttal's done. I guess what we do now is we move on to 9B. Increase city fees more than 5%. It should be that are more than 5%. Or new fees. Um, Melissa? Oh. Um. Uh, Mayor and Council, good evening. Um, so every year we look at um, the fees that the city are charging for the services um, that, you know, that we provide. And I get with all the department heads and we kind of go through um, actually, we have them look line by line through every every fee in their department to see how we're doing as far as if we're collecting enough to cover for the, the cost of the service. Um, and so with that being said, this year, um, uh, we had some fee proposed fee increases and new fees for the building department, um, planning, parks and recreation, um, public works, and our police department. So if Leon would move to that second slide, this just kind of gives an overview of what the fees, you know, the principal of them, and for public services, um, they must be reasonably related but cannot exceed the cost of providing that service. So if you go to the next slide, 
Um, we'll start with the building department. So, now, Melissa, that's such an important point. Could you elaborate a little bit? Um, well, we're they, not making money on fees, and we no, can't they charge. have to provide. It's 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 like an operational. They have to pay for the service that we're providing. So, if we send out, for example, if we send out a building inspector to you know inspect um, a home or do a mechanical inspection or any kind of inspection. That permit needs to, to pay for their time. It needs to pay for um, the staff time to review it, file it, all that interaction. Um, we have to look at those fees each year. And you know, we've done a pretty good job of keeping them low, um, sometimes too low. And that's what we do each year is we find out you know, if the time that's being put in um, pays for what we're actually doing. So it, it does take a little bit of time to kind of look at that. So, um, you know, and it's hard. Right now, we're, you know, it's a very busy time for the city. And so I'm really proud of our department heads for doing that because it is hard to kind of break it down and look and see and kind of look at the workflow as well. And so Did that answer? Your yeah, simply fees are charged to break even for yes. the cost. Yes, yes. Yes. And are not, we're not generating. No, we don't, we can't make money off of them, so. It's to pay for the service that we provide. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting. I just we've got enough people here. It's nice to discuss things once. Okay. So moving on. So we started with the building department. These are um, some proposed increase fee. Um, the residential plan review. I'm not going to go through these. You know, I, I don't want to read through the slideshow, but. Um, Residential plan review, um, we increase this fee to mirror what other jurisdictions are doing and to cover our staff time. So um, what our building inspectors do is, um, you know, as you can tell, building is going, you know, is, is happening at a pretty increased rate compared to the several years past. So we look to see where we're at with this. So we, right now, we're charging 10% of the cost of the building permit, and um, the proposed increase is to do 20% of the cost of the building permit, which, um, uh, calling around to the other cities um, and seeing the staff that it goes through because it's not just one person that reviews these plans. So um, it goes, I believe it goes to the planner, goes to the engineer, um, and then to the building inspector. So um, so that they propose that increase for residential <coughs> plan review. Um, mechanical permits. Now this one, um, this there's several different permits under mechanical permits. So there are things such as um, gas water heater, heat pumps, things like that, um, air to heat exchange. So this, they went from $45, the proposed, to 85 because what they were doing is they were taking several trips out and they charge them each time. So this is actually, this ends up being cheaper, depending on if you put in a hot water heater and then, then you're going and doing some duct work and stuff like that. So when I asked him about this, because I, I said, you know, you need to explain this to me, he said this is actually better because a lot of times they get charged for different things under a mechanical permit. So mm -hmm. one mechanical permit doesn't cover everything. You said it doesn't? Doesn't. So this, they were the eighty-five dollars is actually you know ends up being cheaper than what they were charged before if you do it for a fireplace and then you do it for here and then you do it for gas piping and so this did you mean to say it didn't cover everything where now it is covering everything? Well yes that's correct. Yes, yes. Okay. Every different Before. thing so this had a permit. Every single everything. tiny thing was adding up. So he right. thought they thought that this would be better. So it just yes. One fee covers. Yes, so I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Um, um, with, with that, I mean that that kind of conflicts with the 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 opening statement of impact fees don't make money. That if if we're charging what it's costing us to perform the services, if we're making multiple trips, then the forty five dollars seems like that's the appropriate fee to be charging. If you're giving them an umbrella that $85 covers everything, and we're still having to make multiple trips to do those inspections, um, but it's at a savings because you only had to pay for the permit once, but we're still having to perform the same level of work and effort to do so? Well, but I did ask him a little bit about that. And so before the way that it was, I have a list here that I don't think we have up. <coughs> so, um, so for example, um, we have heat pump. Uh, we've got the evaporative coolers. We've got the type one hood. So they were going out before for all those things. They will. There are times that they have to go back. They, they do. They have to go back and look at something. But the way that this comes up is, they try to do most of these things together. 
So when I asked Darren, our building inspector, about it, he said that he thought that this was better simply because they try to do it all in one visit, and if they don't, I don't think they charge them again if they have to go back out. And I would think the 45 to 85 would be the number of things that need to be inspected. There's yeah. So there's so playing there. So yeah. There's cost savings that can go into place here. So instead of having like a water softener and a heater and, a heater and stuff like that, and you go out and you do one visit and you check all three of those, but you're also you have three different permits for each one of them. You're going out there one time to check all three. Yes. Okay. So in that, you can do an umbrella visit. You go out there, you check all three at once, and you're good. Now, if there's something wrong with any one of those items, we do charge a re-inspection yes. fee yes. That, that if we're forced to go out a second time because something wasn't right. So every time we go out there, there's ability to have another fee, but it doesn't make sense to charge three permit fees of $45 a piece when you go out one visit and you check all three items. Well, couldn't I say the same thing about a property owner that's replacing my hot water heater? I have to pay $85 for them to come out and check that one item because the building department is in the habit of checking three items at the same time. And so now I'm having to pay what the builders are having to pay to check yeah, an entire there's house. A separate, there's a separate line for that one thing. So I think the swing from 45 to 85 is another thing. Not every house is going to have a water softener. So if I'm looking at one thing, your overall fee is this, but if I have to look at three things, or four or five, it's 85. So, yes, so if you if you have a gas water heater, you would pay 15. Okay. If you had multiple things, you buy the umbrella permit for eighty-five dollars and get multiple things covered. Well, forty-five to eighty-five. Forty-five yes. to eighty-five. And the number of things. But it says here processing fee for all permits. That line item is changing from forty-five to eighty-five. So the way I'm interpreting this is that this means that it's going to be eighty-five dollars plus the individual items. Is that not right? And that's a possibility. I don't know the answer to that question. We'd have to have a building official here to, to clarify that. I don't get that impression. It says right there at the top. I know what it says. I can read it. Well, and, and I can ask him for sure. Uh, that's just how it was, it, it was explained to me and how I understood it. But that is a good question. And again, if there is a motion to approve the fees, you can subtract one of the fees out of it. There will be, uh, just by the way, there will be one more public hearing on a fee increase because we didn't have the information available at this particular time. So we will have another one before the you end. You could bring it back this year. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So moving on down to the residential re-roof um, with the tear-off. Um, same thing, we, we did do this to look and see what the time that we were spending to do that and the staff time. Apparently with um, you know, the storms that we've had and stuff like that, this is happening more and more often. Please go to the next slide, please. Okay, so these are the proposed new fees. Now these, this was kind of interesting. So the residential window replacement, the reside, um, those again are people doing like remodeling things to their homes. Now, when I spoke with our building department, they said that we did not have a fee that this would go under. And so we are required by the code to require a permit for it. We just never had a fee for it. So, which was kind of silly. Um, so those were the proposed fees. Um, I do know that he called around to the other jurisdictions to kind of see what they were at. Um, we're getting this more and more with, you know, people remodeling their homes, putting different siding on there, changing out their windows. Um, so th this is what they came up with with their staff time and how long it takes to do those type of inspections. Um, the sign structure permit, this is a little different than what kind of how we had it before. We've always had sign permits, but these are new. Um, the over eight feet uh, and under eight feet, um, we had quite weird descriptions before. So um, he did call around to the other jurisdictions and see kind of how they did it. Um, so the over eight feet, is $300 is what they're proposing, and the under eight feet is $200. And they do still have, in the in there, they have a miscellaneous sign um, fee, which has been in there for a long time. I didn't put it up because it's not one that's increasing. So anything that doesn't fall in, into those, and I was kind of curious about that, I was asking, well, what would that be, you know? And 
can be a sandwich board or it's just something weird, something that's not norm, you know, not the norm. So um, if it doesn't fall into one of those two categories, I think that is um, a $50 fee for a miscellaneous or all other signs. So these two fees, the sign structure permits are for freestanding signs. Mm -hmm. The over eight feet or engine required engineering under eight feet typically don't. Miscellaneous fee would cover something like a projecting sign that um, is perpendicular to a building face, like on a bracket, it still needs to be reviewed to ensure that it's safe. So that would be miscellaneous because it's not freestanding. Okay, and moving on. Now this is a planning increase in new fees. So the public notice, notice advertising, um, this is one that I'm kind of surprised we haven't increased from a couple years ago because advertising in the paper has gone up exponentially. Um, we are required by state law to, to use the, the quarterly press as our uh, official paper. And um, it, it, it is, it's very costly. We, the cities are their best customers as far as the legal sections go. Um, so that increase was in, uh, proposed from $60 to 140 which I can still say in some of the advertising with some of the development and planning stuff that we have, that's still not going to cover everything. Um, but I, I thought, that, I mean, I agree that was a, a good increase because it's, it is, it's very costly for the city to, to post those. Um, but, on, but on the average, 140 will mm -hmm. be over some and not under, under some. others so that we should net out. As a zero one. That's what we're hoping, yes. Um, the, two, the one in yellow are proposed new, new fees. The uh, one up above in white, the advertising, is just a uh, proposed fee increase. So the sign deposit, now this is fairly new, and I, maybe I can ask Carrie to elaborate a little bit on that. Um, it's basically a fee for the applicant to put up their signs in their uh, area of their proposed project. Um, we pay the cost of the signs and we'll hold the check as a deposit until the signs are returned. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is, um, of course, we pay to have those signs made, um, and they are um, they're made out of, of material called Corex to keep them lightweight. Um, they do degrade over time with multiple uses. The intent of this is to um, move the responsibility for posting the property from city staff that doesn't really have a lot of time to do it over to the applicant. So we would get the sign prepared for them, they would come in and pick the sign up, give us a check for $50. We would hold that check until they bring the sign back and then trade them. So that we get our sign back, as long as it's still in good shape and we can reuse it, we'll give them their deposit back. So that just helps to um, mitigate some of the costs of having staff run around and having to find materials and tools to hammer the things into the ground and, and maintain them, etc. So it would put that burden um, back on the applicant to keep the signs erected and in a good condition for the entirety of the comment period. I like that. Um, and the next one, the residential site plan review, um, single lot. This was added because, um, so there's a check for residents, if they want to construct something that doesn't require a building permit, like a porch or a shed, um, or if somebody has gotten a building permit and they want to make a change to it, it still has to be reviewed. for the. If they already have the building permit, it will need to be reviewed again. Um, the first one, we're seeing this, I guess the best example of this would be with people that build uh, build a shed or a porch or an outbuilding and go to sell their house and you know can say that it has been inspected, it's been looked at, it's been approved by the city. Yeah, so we, we previously um, put something in place to allow this kind of thing. Um, basically, the residential site plan. Um, what, the, what this would allow is that we, if, if somebody wants to put in a building, an accessory building that's under 200 square feet, um, or like they're um, going to attach a deck onto their house, which requires, still requires a building permit, that kind of thing, um, they can pay the site plan review and make sure that it meets all the requirements for the lot coverage, maximums, the setbacks, all that good stuff. Make sure they're putting it in the correct place. The other thing that this will cover is that we get lots and lots of especially new development um, plans in that come in kind of as blanket plans. The designer has not 
plan based on site conditions. So they get an approval after it's been through um, planning for site plan review and everything. And then the, the builder will come back and be like, oh, well, we can't put the driveway here and this there and that there. We, need, we want to change everything. Well, it's our time, basically, that we have to go back and re-review a site plan. So this just covers the, you know, just a minimal Change. amount of time to re-review that. I really like this because I think it's cheap insurance. Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. now, utility building's 200 square feet. Ten years from now, it might be 150. Yeah. Some uh, code enforcement guy will show up and tell you, <laughs> yeah. you can't have 200 feet, and you can say, yeah. It's on file. Yep. Yeah, ten bucks, absolutely. Ten bucks is a beautiful thing to have. Yep. For the and it'll guarantee. create a paper trail not only for, um, you know, not only for the peace of mind of the people putting it in, but then it remains with the file. And um, you're right, if it becomes one of those enforcement things in the future where setbacks have changed or something else and we get another one of those big blanket complaints like, I want you to look at every shed in town, then we can actually um, say, oh, yeah, that, that was yeah, we got been paper reviewed and yeah, it was found to be in code. Yeah. So, so that's sure. not a mandatory, though. I mean, that, I do that at my own, for my own personal satisfaction in here. Yeah, for accessory structures, it would be, um, it would be elective because you don't have to have a building permit. So, um, but it would be mandatory for, like, a resubmittal of a site plan or something so like that. When Godfathering came around, you'd be in. That was the grandfather, yeah. Yep, grandfather, yep. I like that one. I do too. So moving on to Park and Rec Department, um, increased fees. They um, they have a lot of fees, <laughs> a lot of parks, a lot of programs. Um, and so this basically this year with the park reservations um, in all the parks, uh, they have requested that they increase the fee, the rental fees, for ten dollars for residents and non-residents. So that goes for the blocking of the four hours and the eight hour rentals. Um, uh, we're still cheaper than most every city around. Um, I talked to Post Falls not too long ago. Uh, actually, we've actually rented from Post Falls through our, our baseball club and stuff. So um, we still are the cheapest around. So. Least expensive. Yes, sorry, <laughs> least expensive. Um, and so I, that was that wasn't really a big shock that that, that came forward this year. Um, recreational fees. Our recreational programs are amazing. We get kids from all over, not just in our own town, but from all over other cities, Kellogg, everywhere. Um, and so the proposed fee increase for all the youth rec recreational activities is five dollars for both residents and non-residents to cover the player costs. Um, field use fees. Um, all fields, so our ball fields, is basically what we're talking about, uh, have been proposed to increase by $5. Tournament and season use fees increased by $25 for youth and adult teams. So that would be like a baseball team that maybe um, reserved the, team, the field for the season, which is typically three months, Eric? Three or four? Four months. Four months. Um, so still we are the most reasonable all the way around in fact we're getting teams from all over trying to come out here and use our fields because they are nice and they are, are very reasonably priced so not i wasn't really surprised at that at all ah the mayor's golf cup tournament so uh, this proposed increase is from 280 dollars to 300 dollars per golf team um, we're getting more uh, teams that are participating not only that it depends on what course we use for that some have a restaurant some we have to cater so um, that was the proposed fee that, uh, that, that came forward from the Park and Rec Commission. Um, ball field lights. Whoa, 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 whoa. So those funds are spent how? Donated. We donate them to a college. Charities. Charities, yes. that's yes. right. Yep. Um, ball field lights. Now this one has been, um, this is a large increase proposed, but we can explain why. Um, so our ball field lights that we have out at Majestic Park, when we put them in, we weren't sure um, how that was going to work, um, the cost, you know. And so I, Eric did a good job, but there was really no way of knowing what that was going to be. So we were s severely underpriced compared to what we were being charged. Um, we've worked with Kootenai Electric. They have a demand charge that they hit us with, which is pretty significant. And I know council, we've talked about this before. Um, 
So Eric did a good job of doing a bunch of uh, research throughout the year for the different events, city events, events that we rented it out for. Um, and so they're proposing the fee increase to go from $75 to $125 per field per day for lights. It's still extremely reasonable, um, you know, especially when you go to other other areas like Coeur d'Alene or Post Falls. So I, I still think we could have raised that a little bit more because we, we still don't know. We don't know. It's, it's Leon's going to do, a, we're going to do a utility audit because um, it's been really hard to get some direct answers as to why we get hit with that big charge. So, um, okay, so public works. We have a question. Oh, go ahead. If you could back up to the previous slide. We're talking about um, fees and, and how they're associated with a cost to mm -hmm. provide that service. I question the mayor cut how that one is tied to a service that's provided when it's funds that are donated, or if that should be as a part of the. Of but it was what SCSB, what you said? If it's if we're talking about in, increase of city fees in, um, in excess of five percent, is this really a fee or is this more of a of a volunteer donation type of of event? Is it appropriate for it to be a part of the city "quote unquote" fees because the, the funds are donated and it's not so like yeah, register? Yeah. It is because if we charge anything, <coughs> regardless of what the purpose is, if that price goes up, it has to go through this process. So even if it was for, even if it was for a painting class, and the instructor's fee went up. And for us to raise it to match the instructor's fee, it's completely voluntary. Right, but, but it's tied to a specific service. It fee. is, but this is kind of tied too to the fact that we have to pay for the golf course, we have to pay for Here. the caterer, Carts. we have to pay for all these things. Most of the money that comes in through these fees cover those uh, golf carts, the fees for the, the, lunch. the golf carts, the lunch, and so forth like that. A lot of the money that ends up getting donated is from the sponsors, and we don't. The holes, they donate or they yeah. sponsor holes, okay. and they have little contests. But yeah, so we're on covering our costs <laughs> to make Play, sure that we don't. Five mulligans and just so that we don't get into uh, the donations from the sponsors to cover the cost, cost of, of the, the event. event. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, Eric, how much did that give to uh, Singer? The mayor's cut <laughs> gave what forty five hundred bucks to. I think it was forty two hundred dollars that we donated this year to the um, put it on the spot. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, we donated <coughs> to. I can't remember. No, no, senior center. I know last year. Last year they was they it to K Tech. Split the donation. Yes, thank you. I drew a blank there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, K Tech, new equipment for the K Tech. Good. And last year they split it in thirds to Little League, Junior Tackle Football, and. Um, like Little League. Yeah, yeah. So this year it would have been tax money that would have went to K Tech that we donated. Yep. So this next one, the Public Works um, Department, this really is the only fee that's kind of coming forward. This is our sewer service base fee. So um, as many of you know, we are uh, we are partners with Post Falls with our sewer system. We send all of our wastewater over there. We are in an agreement with them. Um, and so in that agreement, it states every year that there will be increased raises. And um, we pass this on to the customer, of course. And so that's why you'll see a sewer increase each year. It's not anything we really have much of a choice over. Um, you know, we're not allowed to have our own sewer uh, wastewater treatment program here. So um, every year we get a letter from Post Falls. We, kind of, we know what it's going to go up because we're in this long-term agreement with them. So this year, the increase, it's usually, it's almost $3 every year is what it's kind of worked out to be the last several years. And I want to point out that the city of Rathrum's share, which usually covers transportation mm -hmm. and all of that, hasn't been increased for several years. Mm -hmm. This is just the post the post falls portion that's passed along. Um, same thing with the sewer flow rate. Um, so that is going from 11 to 11.50. And so back to sewer, we're still paying off for the 
um, improvements to reduce nitrogen? Is that still happening? It wasn't because of volume, it was because to eliminate the nitrogen out of the water that they were reintroducing. I don't know the answer to that yeah. question. Well, it was, just oh. so you know. <laughs> um, so that, you know, that's our increase this year. Um, if you go ahead and switch to the next slide, I'll show you. And then also as well, with the sewer, comes the cap fees. So um, as you've been talked about before, uh, you build a new house, you're going to pay a cap fee. Um, this is not a fee that existing uh, residents pay. This is new growth paying for itself. Um, the City of Coast Falls raised their sewer portion hookup from 3433 to 3570. Um, City of Rathrum is not raising their portion. And so um, every year when we go through this, um, we look to raise that, and we haven't raised that in several years. So that again is something that they pass along to us, which we pass along to the developers. Thank you. And once again, it wasn't strictly nitrogen, it was nitrogen and phosphates. Well, yeah. Going over to Washington, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so this was actually kind of a fun one. Um, police department never has fee increases they, since I've been here because they really um, don't have a ton of fees. <laughs> so um, vehicle expect inspection or bin inspection. So um, this increase is uh, due to documentation costs for the increased inspection. It's also, it hasn't been increased in 28 years. Yeah. I went back and researched this because I was kind of thought it was kind of funny. Three dollars to five. It, anyway, so um, basically, if you want to get a VIN inspection, if you're selling a vehicle or um, buying a vehicle for that matter, you can go have the police do a VIN inspection and run that, make sure it's not stolen, um, has a you know a trash title, anything like that. So this is their pro one proposed increase for this next uh, coming year. Any other questions? Questions. Yeah, we did a good job. I have one. That, this is all the fees that are increasing, not just the ones that are greater than 5%, because there's a lot of that that's on there that is less than 5% increase. We didn't do it. So if there's a fee that's increasing more than 5%, um, then, or less than 5%, I apologize, doesn't need a public hearing. Um, and then I don't think there was any fees that there were wasn't increasing any. less than 5%. 11 to 11 to 50? That's um, in here for the public hearing. Yeah. That's what I'm saying is that it's less than 5%. So I just, oh. So this is all the fees then? That that's yeah. all the fees. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And that's your presentation? Yes, sir. And once again, we'll go through the public process. <laughs> uh, those that would like to come up and speak in favor of these public fee increases <laughs> and new fee uh, pricing. Those that would like to speak neutrally. Those that would like to speak against. Yes, sir. Bill Naysayer here. Mike Fox, 13403 North Grand Canyon. Um, I, I guess just a question. What is the current residential sewer rate. I think the website still shows 60 per month. And this shows 66. Oh. So, so it's 66? It's mm -hmm. 66. Yeah. Okay, right now 20. I have the proposed fees up on the website. The proposed. It's been 66 for sewer and $20 for water with, for a total of $86 a month. 66 to 69 again is, is less than a 5% increase. So I was I couldn't figure out why it was on there. If it was, you know, it was on there. Okay, so that's one there. everybody sees. So it's it's nice to throw it out there. But what I saw didn't have the current rates. It just showed proposed the new ones and the ones that were increasing over five percent. So I, okay, uh, then I, I have nothing to say about the sewer fee. What what I would like to talk about though is the development impact fee. Um, as I understand the way this works, and these are not the capitalization fees or the connection fees for water or anything else for residential building permit. This is for the permit itself, and it's designated as a development impact fee. And there's a formula in the, I guess the fees, the original fees were scheduled by 
some committee or commission that was uh, set up, <coughs> excuse me, to design those fees. <coughs> and they're listed in an Appendix L in the city code. And Appendix L has what the value of a home is uh, on the application, and then the building permit fees or the development impact fees are calculated off of that that value, that estimated value of the new home. Uh, for 2019, and this I don't know those estimated values. I'm not sure who puts those on there. They're on the application, so I'm assuming they come from the builder. The builder says what the value of that estimated value of that home is. 2019, 119 permits, and the total estimated value was 30.4 million. That, that's an average estimated value of 256,000. That I don't think there's been a house built for 256,000 in Rathman for a number of years. But in two, in 2020, same thing, 220 or 288 permits and 73.4 million. That's an average estimated value of 254,000. So the estimated value went down from 2019 to 2020 for these homes. Now that's the value that determines that, that fee. <clears throat> Those fees are set, were set by this commission approved by the committee, or by the council. In um, the code, that <clears throat> establishes those fees and how they're to be processed. There's a provision in there, and Will uh, might want to look this up. It's Rathbun Code 9-4-8. It has an automatic inflation adjustment to that. And I don't know where, that's funny? No, it's just that we just ran into the same thing ourselves. Well, I just wondered why uh, I don't know how often that code or that development fee has been increased, but uh, it has the the actual index, the reference index. It's the engineering news record. Um, I looked it up, and for August, uh, those construction costs have increased 8.8 percent. Yeah, you're right, it, and that's something like I'm saying that we just ran into that ourselves. And Mr. Mayor, just the to fees, throw out however, you are Mr. not based on the value of the house. Mr. Fox, based what? on the value of their impact. So, Mr. Fox, um, I, earlier I had mentioned to uh, Mike that we, if he denied a fee, we could add it to the additional public hearing that we were planning on doing at the end of September. That end of September is that impact fee because our staff hasn't looked up that value yet and when we were made aware of that increase that was available, it was past the deadline to get the public notices out for uh, fee increases. So that is why in the final council meeting of September, we'll have another public hearing on fee increases that would include that one. Now state law governs it over this. We still have to have a public hearing on that. We can't automatically increase it even though our city code says that we do. Anything over 5% has to have a public hearing. So at the end of September, we'll be having another public hearing that addresses the impact fees. Okay. And uh, has that ever been adjusted like the code says it's supposed to be every year? Uh, I've not in the last couple of years, no. It's not every year, but it's, it's frequently we have an impact fee committee come together. And it's based on really the impact of each additional house to the park system, the highway system, and used to be the police, but I think that's all we have. close the impact fee yeah. for police because of the we, we can never restriction of it's been. Has the restriction it. to use it. Yeah. It's restricted for capital projects. I know that's that. right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you have only have eight years. To do with what you collect on here for the fee. The, fee uh, the fees are based on the impact each house has on, say, the parks. So here is the value of the park. So when the committee meets, here is the value of the park system. Here is that divided into each house. So each new house has to pay the appropriate share to cover the cost so that they buy their way into the system. But the fee is set by schedule. Not yes, by yeah. that's correct. And that fee is established in schedule based off of the evaluation and the analysis of the impact fee study that goes on for transportation and parks. 
But it's a set fee. It's not. It's a set fee, yeah. and it it for circulation, it it's for it, it it circulation is based off of trips, mm -hmm. and park is based off of acreage um, and the value of the, the value of the acreage, and every home that it's added, there's a formula that goes along with that. Okay. Then there will be some information come out on that, what the new fees are. When we've got it all put together, we'll probably be before the end of next week so that we can make the public notice requirements for the additional impact fee increase. Effective October 1st, is that when the budget? Is yes, effective? October 1st is when the budget. And the new fees become effective. And before. that's correct. All right, thank you. Yeah, when, so we just stumbled into this inflationary process. We thought that... Actually, it was Mr. Fox that brought it up at a previous meeting. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Question. You got a question. Sorry. Um, with us having a public hearing tonight based on impact fees for the next physical year, um, if approved tonight, wouldn't these things have to be reviewed again at the next public hearing? No. Because it seems disingenuous to the public to say that there's a public notice about a fee increase and only talk about that one fee increase, but there's all these other fee increases that have already occurred. The requirement is to t notify the public that there's a public fee increase and that you can go to the website to see what the new impact fee will be. Once this is adopted, uh, this resolution that is adopted, then those on our website will change and then when we put a notice out again for the next public hearing on the fee increase, the only one that will show a reference is the development impact fee. Yeah. So uh, some cities do these fee increases multiple times throughout the year. We try to get them all around the time of the budget. Well, thank you. Anyone else like to speak against? Uh, seeing none, the public portion is done. Would the staff now like to do uh, any follow-up? I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. I think I followed up during the <laughs> comments. It was timely. All right, let's move forward here. Uh, C, the 2021-2022 uh, budget hearing. Mr. Dews. Mr. Mayor. Um, throughout the summer since April, we've been working on the proposed budget. Uh, just to give an idea to the public that's here, what that process has been, we've had workshop, several workshops throughout the summer on the budget working on every single department and presentations by those departments for their budget increases. Um, in July, we approved a final draft budget for publication. That publication was made uh, with the notice of our public hearing. We also ran into a situation where back in April, we set this public hearing date for August 18th, which was last week. However, since that date of setting, the, or since April of setting the date, the state legislature passed a new bill that changed the property tax formula. And because of that and the dates that we were getting our information, we were unable to complete the budget because of that in a timely manner to have that August 18th meeting. So we published in the newspaper as required by state law that we were changing our public hearing date to August 25th. Um, and that leads us to today. Um, our proposed budget, um, we've had a couple of changes to our budgeting process this year. First is that House Bill 389 that I mentioned. Uh, I want to point out that the normally in the process, and I'm saying it more for the public rather than for the council because they're already aware of this, um, before new growth would come in at last year's levy rate and that would be growth paying for itself and in, in adding to the property tax bill. Um, this year the city is only allowed to take 90 percent of the value of that growth and use it against a estimated current year levy rate. So that changes everything quite a bit. Um, one point that I've got in another slide, um, our value of our property here in Rathdrum went up $157 million in one year. 
uh, assessed value. So that changed the levy rate quite a bit and lowered that levy rate. So with the combination of the two things, we would have used about $190,000 of new growth taxes to come into the budget, where with the new legislation that reduced it to $150,000. So there was a, a reduction there. Um, the city this year is not budgeting every dollar that is in the financial statements for the city. Um, to find out what the financial status of the city is, we recommend to look at the monthly financial statements that are published in the packet and available to the public. Um, and then this year also we're taking a lot of our one-time purchases like a um, de-icing truck and some of those other type of items and we're pulling them out of the fund balance rather than making the existing taxpayers pay a higher tax to purchase those items. And that fund balance comes from year over year savings that builds up within that fund balance because we try not to spend as much as we budget. Um, also changes over last year, the market value, like I said, for the city of Rathrum went up about $157 million. Um, taxes have not been increased uh, for four years. Uh, other than new growth money. Um, in 2018, we had a 1.92% property tax increase, and there hasn't been an increase since then. Um, we have $4.7 million in savings for a new city hall. This savings oh, yeah. is... Sorry, would you elaborate a little bit about the... There are some people that don't know about taxing authority and 3%. Okay. When so you say no new taxes, it, Right, so the city is allowed to take a 3% property tax increase plus new growth, which is new construction and annexation. The new construction and annexation has a value. Um, they haven't been taxed priorly, prior, so you are able to use a levy rate to figure out what those taxes might be for that new growth and add it to your budget. Therefore, the value of the dollar doesn't keep diminishing every time you have somebody build a new house or things like that. So it's meant to keep it level and stable. And we're allowed 3% and we haven't done that. Either. And we're allowed 3% in addition to that. Matter of fact, uh, our records show that since 2008, the city has never taken, in, during that time period, a full 3% increase in property taxes. There has been some one percent, there's been some less than one percent, a little more than one percent, but never more than two percent. Okay. Um, anyway, on the city hall, the new city hall, the city has actually been saving money for this rather than bonding. When you do a bond, you get the amount up front and then you pay an interest rate on that bond just like your mortgage payment. The city's actually saving the money putting it into an investment pool account uh, that the state does, it's legal by state law, and we generate an interest on that money, and then that will help to pay for a construction of a new city hall. Um, this is better than bonding, because if we bond for the full amount, then the citizens have to have an increased tax burden, and they have to pay the interest rate on that bond for the life of the bond. Um, the levy rate just um, over the last five years has been reduced from 0 .0057 to 0 .0034. Again, this is a combination. One, the city's not increasing the property taxes every year, and two, the market value of the housing has been going up. So there's two things that, that contribute to that. Um, our building permits this year are actually down. We were at this time last year, August 17th, at 178 single family residential permits. This year we're at 106. Um, we're also doing some major road projects. Starting Monday, this next week, there'll be construction on the Meyer 53 intersection that will be a traffic light that will be there. Okay, um, and then on the Meyer and Bakel roundabout, we are shy one of five parcels to complete the purchase of that roundabout and then we can start scheduling construction. We we're really hopeful that we would have that completed 
and start construction this summer, but one property owner has not sold their piece to make that happen. Um, here's the tax history like I talked about. 0% uh, increases from 19 to 22. Um, here is our general fund revenue uh, budget. Actual in 19 to 20, budget for 20 to 21. Uh, only because 2021 is not complete yet and the 21 to 22 proposed budget. Um, again, these numbers were reviewed by the City Council quite extensively over the summer. Um, do want to point out there's a major increase in the shared revenue. Uh, our budget last year was almost 1.3 million and that's gone up to 1.6. A big part of that, you'll see the actual in the previous year was up to 1.5 million. Uh, the big reason for that is a change in the revenue sharing formula down at the state for cities that were getting less than an average per capita for the entire state. They got bumped. Rathrum is less than the average per capita. We got a pretty big bump on that and that will continue until the point that we are at average and then we'll only see a 1% increase until everybody is at average. Um, projected wise, it's going to be 10-15 years before we're even close to that average amount. Um, the enforcement services, uh, notice the budget went from 16500 last year to 92000 this year. This is a revenue line item. Uh, most of this is due to the fact that we have a uh, MOU that's also on the agenda tonight that the school district will pay for 65% of salary and benefits for an SRO uh, school resource officer. Um, and then the rest of the fundings as shown there. Uh, expenditures, uh, want to point out that the mayor and council pay actually had an ordinance that was passed at the last council meeting this proposed number reflects the what was adopted at that meeting uh, for mayor and council pay. Um, the finance and administration budget, there was an increase of about $61,000. That's the finance and administrative share of a new city attorney. Um, law enforcement has an increase. Um, there are some other things that they've got for equipment but also that SRO they're paying for in addition the 35% uh, of that new SRO for the benefits and salary. Public Works saw some increase. Um, planning and zoning saw some increase. Engineering actually saw a decrease and the building department has an increase as well. Um, to note though, kind of shared between public works and building and planning and zoning, engineering, all of that, somewhere in the works there is the new build public works inspector position that was authorized by the council through the budgeting process, so that's included in there as well. Uh, streets, uh, an increase there. Um, parks and Rec, this is a little bit of an increase. Parks, just a small increase. Cemetery, just a small increase. Uh, recreation, some as well. Other expenditures a bit. And then the transfer to capital project went down quite a bit from 224,000 to 30,000. That 30,000 is for equipment with the police department. Okay, our designated revenues and capital projects, is, this is one of those points that I made before, we're not budgeting for everything. There is some emergency funds that are available, almost a million dollars. We're not budgeting to expend those. If we do have an emergency, we'll open up the budget and add those in. Uh, capital projects is the 30,000 that we've talked about. Um, special revenue funds are the park impact fees and our cemetery funds. Um, and um, it's currently the pol uh, policy that city all funds are placed into the budget and the purpose of this policy is to be transparent to the budget. We did tweak that a little bit, but the circulation impact fees, we are budgeting 100% of that because of the big road improvements that we're doing and the funds that we use for that. Um, and I didn't update that second bullet point, but we'll... 
So the revenues for this, um, $2 million in our special revenue funds with the expenditures of $2 million. Um, that also, just by the way, I want to point out for the public that's here, we did budget through the parks impact fee to spend up to $500,000 for a purchase of a new city park. Um, our enterprise funds, our water funds, and our sewer funds, our capital funds for those water and sewer, and some of these projects require savings for multiple years. Um, I'm going to skip over that slide, it's a repeat of the other. I want to point out here that the revenues projected to receive is $5.4 million, but we're only budgeting to spend 2.1. That's what we plan on spending. The difference between those is what will go into the savings in order to provide for bigger projects in the future. So there would be a possibility that we would see um, revenues plus fund balance for an expenditure that would be higher than the revenues achieved, uh, received in one year um, to pay for big projects. Um, we also anticipate throughout the course of the year as we decide what we're going to do with the ARPA funds that we would reopen the budget to address that. We did receive a little over $900,000 in ARPA funds, but those are restricted for infrastructure projects. So they cannot be used to offset property taxes. They're not a revenue replacement fund. Um, they can be used for broadband. They can be used for water or sewer infrastructure projects. They could have some use for assisting with households and nonprofits and those type of things, but you'd have to go through a grant application process in order to do that. So we're, we're looking at that, and once we decide how we're going to do that, we'll reopen the budget to take care of that. But we do have four years to spend those funds. So it's not a rush to get those spent this year. Okay, and that is the end of the budget presentation, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, Councilor, you have any questions? Just a good job. Okay, so once again, we'll go to the public portion of this. Um, those who would like to come forward and speak in favor of the new budget. Those that would like to come forward and speak neutrally. Those who would like to come forward and speak against. Seeing none, we'll close the public portion. It doesn't look like you really have anything to read. No rebuttal, Mr. Mayor. Rebut. Um, okay. So we'll move on to D, 2021-2022, foregone revenue. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Deuce. By state law, uh, this is another one of those changes that's happened in the last couple of years. Um, the city has the ability to use a 3% property tax increase. In the past, if you did not use that, you could allocate that 3% increase to a foregone. This isn't a bank account. This is not money out of anyone's pocket today but it allows the city at some point in the future, if there is a need, to reach back and, and use those uh, dollars that were allowed to be levied but were not levied. Um, so now you have to have a public hearing in order to talk about whether or not to allocate this 3% increase to the foregone account. Uh, again, this is not dollars that are in a bank account. This is the ability to tax this, uh, the, the public. So, um, the 3% increase that would be allowed this year equals $92,348. If it is the intent of the City Council to move that to foregone, you must pass a resolution. So we're sta simply stating that this is a possibility. Uh, the staff is not making an opinion one way or the other whether we should or shouldn't. Um, 
but it is up to the council to decide whether or not we should or should not reserve these funds for a future use to the to ability to tax the, the public. It's the future ability to tax, as you said. Yes. Uh, since it's a short one, can you give us a quick history? Times that the city has used foregone taxes? We have only used foregone taxes once. I know. And the, at that particular time, the city was charging a fee for street lights. That fee went to everybody. Um, since that time, there have been court decisions to determine if it was an unfair tax rather than a fee. Uh, because if you look at a street corner, the people that live on a street corner, they have a street light that lights up their yard and the street in front of them. You go four houses down the street, there is no light that lights up their yard other than their house lights that they're paying their own electric bills on. And so therefore it was decided that that could possibly be a unfair tax rather than a, or a, a tax rather than a fee. And so the city removed the fee from every individual residence and increased the property taxes by a sum of $80,000 that was a foregone fee. I might point out too that on that particular year that the city adopted that foregone, they did not take the 3% increase, they took a 0% increase on that year, so the only tax increase was the foregone to offset the street light fee, so it was a wash uh, as far as that was concerned. What that equated to for some houses with a low property value, that meant that they were paying less than the fee and then for some property values with the higher property values they were paying a little bit more than the fee. But that's how taxes go. Okay. Question? Oh. Um, just because we set aside a certain amount of foregone money doesn't mean we have to go and get all of it when Correct. we need money. Matter of fact, the state law changed this year. So um, what has happened is, for example, the city of Boise needed a new fire station. Uh, they had, they, fire is one of the departments. And so they took the foregone and put it into their property tax budget to build a fire station and to put the equipment in it. So they took all that foregone at that one particular time. Um, State law changed with House Bill 389, the one that we talked about earlier, that would only allow a city to increase their property tax by 1% using foregone. So there's a very big limit on that. The other option is they could raise their property tax by an additional 3% for a capital project using foregone. However, when that capital project has been completed, then that money would go back to foregone and would not be added to the base. Okay. So even today there is a very huge limitation on the ability to use foregone. Um, One percent would probably be pretty close to about thirty thousand dollars. So of the foregone that we have in there it would take a long time for us to use up the foregone. I do not have a current foregone balance, but I could probably look that up. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, moving on. 10A. This is oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Mayor, we have to do the public hearing sorry. process. I know nobody's going to want to talk about this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> Would anyone like to speak in favor of, I guess, withholding the foregone or taking, it's not actual money, of reserving the right to tax of the foregone amount? Yes. Seeing none, we'll ask, would anyone like to speak neutrally about that? Would anyone like to speak against it? Once again, seeing none, we'll move forward. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Can we have five minutes? Uh, we can. Here's the danger. <laughs> Don't talk to anyone because we've just had four public hearings. 
All right, so we'll take a break, but you have to understand we cannot discuss these things with you. At all. I can do it on the air, but as soon as we start, I gotta turn it back off. I was in the office, I'm all. I don't think I don't think Okay, so <laughs> I'm not going nowhere. Oh, God. <laughs> Just me asking. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to have to get water. I thought she was going to go for you. Yeah.
Can I throw one monkey wrench in here? Yeah. So this letter is from one resident that lives, I believe, in Golden Spikes. No, that lives to the north, I believe. Okay, but in the area, what about the people that own and operate Golden Spikes? What is their feelings? Um, that it wouldn't affect Golden Spike um, because the only the only road that's there now is the West Yosemite, and it's already fenced. Um, and again, this proposal doesn't include any changes to that unless the fire district decides that they want to have another access into Golden Spike or to this new development and they want it opened up. If that's the case, then we can look at options like putting up a Knox box so it's not it's not an open throughway. It okay, understanding all of that. Traffic. Could this decision be made at a list? There'll be several more steps in this process. Yeah, there is a development agreement that's so required. So, do you be proper to put it here? Would be proper to listen from the fire department first and then put it in the final plot? Or yeah, so that one it would be the fire department. I would think that would be an appropriate way. So, it, it'd probably be better to make that. And I understand what Daryl's getting at, because if that's his feeling, he wants it in here. But are we going to do that, and then the fire department's going to come back and say, oh, God, no, you have to have that. Should we wait until later? And that's my question to Daryl. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I have similar concerns as Daryl has. Um, and I was going to mention this, too, is that on, on Prairie Avenue near uh, is it Sunset, Sunset Meadows um, that they have some um, the, like the I think it's Garden Grove edition that has some roads that um, that go out to Prairie but they're blocked off with like a wrought iron fence and they got a knock lock on them too so that then it does provide fire department access to that area for emergency access if they so ch if they so need such access from either side mm -hmm. um, it eliminates the vehicle traffic traveling through golden spikes that um, where people might want to or be tempted to shortcut through that area um, is there an option that if we were to make a proposal that that, that be part of this recommendation um, is to, to include it that that could at some later point be removed either the requirement or the actual fence later on that you know two years so ago. can I jump in real quick on Yosemite no because Yosemite is not part of this project so Yosemite is a completely different subdivision, okay. We're not and with, that's not under consideration. Only the preliminary plat for this subdivision. Now, if you wanted to talk about whether or not the streets that end to the north of this subdivision, or to the west of this subdivision, or to the south of this subdivision, yes, you could make comments regarding those, because that is in this application. Yosemite is not. Gotcha. Mr. Mayor. Oh. We have the ability, as you suggested, to wait to add that information into the when the final plat gets presented to us, correct? Or even the development agreement. Oh, yeah. The I development like agreement yeah. is yeah. is the one that it would be added to in the City Council has to approve the development right. agreement. See, I have a fear that a hundred more people come in and say, oh God, no, I want to access. Well, right now the developers have said that they want to put in a fence in there. Um, and to we, Yosemite. huh? To Yosemite? No, no, the because the Yosemite is not their project. What are we talking about now? We're talking about the north and the east. Okay, north and west? Or yes, sorry, the north okay. and the west. They're saying that they'll fence those. Okay. okay? Uh, the, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the letter that saw, talked about the dead end street was to the north. Mm -hmm. They're saying they'll put a fence in there. We can put that in a ver verbiage of the development agreement. Mm -hmm. um, we do not require by city code that fencing of subdivisions. Um, they have offered that, so therefore you could make it in the findings of facts and conclusions, but the development agreement is when they can say we're going to do X, Y, and Z in this development and we have the ability to put it in there. When is the development agreement coming before us? Because there's 
there's a preliminary plat and then we get the final plat and then the so development agreement comes in before the final plat mm -hmm. and it comes before council yes it yes is. and that's up to I mean, I'm not saying you can't do it one way or the other. I'm just giving you information. Well, the, the development agreement is an agreement between the city and the developer that's a mutual decision. Um, if you want to can make it a condition of approval that they must fence the their property lines, then you need to find code to support it. And we don't have any. Say that again, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't hear that either. If, if you want to condition that they must have fencing have around their development, you have to cite the code section that requires that. And we don't have a code that requires fencing. But they volunteered to do it. They stated it during testimony. So that can be stated as a, as a um, finding of fact and conclusion, um, meaning a supporting element, right? No, the, fi the finding of fact would be the code section that would require them to have fencing. The finding of fact would be that you find the factual <laughs> evidence that they need to have that fence, and me, then the condition that, would be they put in fence. There was a motion that was made here recently regarding um, a donation of, uh, of land to a fire district. It's not a requirement of city code. It's not a requirement of that preliminary plat. No. But yet it was still a finding of fact that the developer has volunteered, that to, volunteered. to do this, uh -huh. to do X, Y, Z, so that yeah. it's on the record that it says that this is Yeah, you could, do, you could do it that way if you want to do a finding of fact that they would volunteer to do that. If that's that's how I was in, oh, sorry, trying to yeah. communicate to you is that that's <laughs> what I'm asking. Um, and then um, the one other question, you know, I, mean, I really strongly support and, and um, the, the concern about Betty Kiefer, um, and I'm a big fan. It doesn't sound like it was a traffic light. I, I was envisioning what was what was being discussed as something more like one of those crossing beacons. The um, flashing crossing. Yep. And that I don't think that it's my opinion. I mean, I'm trying to have an open discussion here with fellow councilmen. Is that um, it's not this development necessarily that's causing um, uh, the issue, or um, but is contributing to it. Um, is there a way that we could? Um, work with the developer to partially fund um, the addition of a, of a crosswalk uh, beacon so the city can front up some and that the developer somehow contribute to that addition of the light of, of, of one of those little crossing beacons. Yeah, so that's, that's what was discussed during the um, Planning and Zoning Commission hearing. Mm -hmm. And the developer did volunteer to work with the city to do that, to find a solution if it's warranted. So really that needs to go through a review with the city engineer to find out if it's warranted to put in that kind of uh, light. Um, and then if so, <coughs> um, that the city may work together to provide that. And that would be done through Public Works and city engineers determination. But that language is included in recommended condition of approval number, number one, um, where we talked about the development agreement. So it may also address what page is light crosswalk signal on Naval Road. What page is that? That, you're so that is on page eight of the staff report under condition, recommended conditions of approval number one. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I'm ready to make a motion if there's... Um, I have a question. Okay, so first. Um, this is for Leon. Um, when is the signal at Lancaster and 41 and Nagel and 41 going to be in? Prior to fall of 2022. That's the closest you can make it? That's... We have no control over that. That's when they say the project period is going to be over. And therefore, it could be as early as April, but it could be as late as... November, but that's not that's the state's project, so we don't get to control when those things are done. But it could also see delays. Yeah, but what we're also looking at here is a preliminary plat, so right. there's well, construction. Well, concern this because they want to break ground any day. They sure. say fall twenty twenty one, which is today tomorrow that's correct but that doesn't mean break ground for building houses they have to put in streets they have to put in water and sewer they have to build out Rio Grande 
they have to do all of those things and then it has to have it you know your development agreement you have to have your final plat all of those things have to be done before you can get one permit to build a house the development agreement will come before they break ground for any improvements public improvements are covered in the development agreement okay so, so just just from first. a safety standpoint i'd like to see those signals in before they start building houses i can understand that but we can't require it because that's not part of our city code mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I do make a motion. Would that entertain a motion? I would like to make a motion um, to approve with recommendation, finding conclusion, and conditions of approval. Um, well, I'm sorry, I move to approve the preliminary, preliminary plan with the recommended findings of fact, conditions of law, and conditions of approval as found in the Planning Commission's recommendation of staff report finding that is in accordance with city staff. The city of rafter and comprehensive plan and rafter and city code as conditioned additional conditions of approval i further move that the following additional it's not really a condition um finding further fact that uh, the developer has volunteered to fence the um the road stubs to the adjacent properties to the north and west north and the east sorry north or oh, west sorry it's my bad west. West. i'll second that motion means so any further discussion Sherry, if you would. Is it green? Michael Hill? Aye. Daryl Rucker? Aye. Paula Laws? Aye. Stephen Adams? No. Uh, motion passes. Moving on. This is B. This is also an action on my item. Consideration and adoption of city fee or resolution. Mr. Sorry. Mayor, this is the resolution that has been presented to the City Council uh, through a public hearing. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Mr. Rickard. Yeah, before you do, I have one comment. If I could encourage the, um, the mechanical permit to be tabled until the next um, public hearing to have additional um, information about that at the <coughs> Mr. Mayor. I'd, okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to make a comment too. But um, I hope next year we can double the fee for dog pickups by the police department. I think the fee schedule is way too low. Uh, too many dogs have been picked up recently, and we need to get serious about the people being responsible for their pets. Fees can only be what yeah. the cost is, does though. It isn't a social remedy for things. I understand. But we can look into we that and see if, it, if the cost, if the fee currently matches the cost, and if it doesn't, we can address that. At another time. Yeah, and I think if we're going to add things, I'd add finger pen to that too. <laughs> so, I think yeah. we charge 10 bucks or 8 bucks and it's 38 or Take some time. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion, I think. <laughs> Go ahead, I've tried to move I would like to <laughs> move that we approve the resolution of the City of Rathrum for the fees for services. Um, with excluding the mechanical fee uh, to be uh, tabled when we get more information tell for the next public Second. hearing. Second. I second it. Motion made, and I guess pick your seconds. <laughs> uh, well, any uh, additional comments? Sheriff, you would please take a roll. Darrell Rickard? Aye. Paula Laws? Aye. Thank you. Michael Hill? Aye. Stephen Adams? Aye. Motion passes. When we now see, this is also an action item. Consideration of the annual appropriation ordinance. Remind me, Mr. Mayor, that this is an ordinance and we'll have to go through the ordinance process. 
And I believe Melissa is giving you a motion sheet, or do we just no, use the other one? It's okay. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. All right, this is the annual appropriations ordinance to adopt the budget for the city of Rathrum. The total of the sum of the budget was $10,343,814. Also, of things to, uh, the ordinance does estimate the expenditures. Uh, the most important thing I want to point out is that it uh, addresses the tax levy to be in the amount of $3,236,877. Um, that information will be put on L2, sent on to the state uh, the county uh, so that they can do that. And um, this ordinance. Uh, uh, is then presented to the council. Council, any questions? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I'd like to make, make a motion that the ordinance entitled the Annual Appropriation Ordinance for the Fiscal Year beginning October 1st, 2021. Is that all I need? Yes. Okay. Uh, be placed on its first reading by title only under suspension of the rules and to wayward second and third reading readings. I'll second that. Motion made and second. Any further discussion? Sherry, if you would please. Daryl Rickard. Aye. Paula Laws. Aye. Michael Hill. Aye. Stephen Adams. Aye. An ordinance entitled the Annual Appropriation Ordinance for the Fiscal Year Beginning October 1st, 2021. Appropriating the sum of 10 million $343,814 to defray the expense and liabilities of the City of Rathrum for said fiscal year, authorizing a levy of a sufficient tax upon the taxable property and specifying the objects and purposes for which said appropriation is made. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, I make a motion to adopt the ordinance entitled the Annual Appropriation Ordinance for the Fiscal Year beginning October 1st, 2021. Second. Motion made and second. Any further discussion? And to publish what we need that to to publish by summary? Uh, we're going to publish it in full. Okay. And we're back to publishing the entire design like it. That's where I was trying to drive last year. It was recommended, and we're going to do New it. New attorney? Okay. Sherry, can you please take the roll? Daryl Rickard. Aye. Paula Laws. Aye. Michael Hill. Aye. Stephen Adams. Aye. Uh, before I say motion passes, uh, did we waive the second and third reading? We did. That was the okay. first motion. I wanted to be sure of that because these are long. <laughs> <laughs> that would be like three days to read this thing. Exactly. <laughs> uh, motion passes. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's not it's like a spelling bill. You have to sit here through it too. <laughs> it's not as pretty as it looked. Uh let's take a look here. D consideration the resolution to reserve the foregone amount for 2021-2022. Mr. Mayor, this is the resolution that must be passed by state law in order to reserve the foregone amount foregone amount for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. I was going to make a motion to deny the resolution to uh, to waive the, um, the foregone taxes, not to, not to hold them. Not hearing a second. Are there any other motions? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I make a motion to uh, approve the resolution um, to reserve the foregone amount of fiscal year 2021-22 for use in subsequent year years as described in that code. I'll second that. Motion made and second. Any further discussion? Chair, if you would. Daryl Rickard. Aye. Paula Laws. Aye. Mike Hill. Aye. Stephen Adams. Aye. Motion passes. Lisa, moving on. E, an action yes. item. No. Not for a resolution. Not oh, okay. Consideration of a member, memorandum of understanding 
with the Lakeland School District for a school resource officer as our own. Mr. Mayor, I'll start this out, and then if Lisa has, uh, if the board has any, or the council has any questions for Lisa, she's here to comment on those if it need be. Um, this is, uh, we've talked about this, we brought to forward to you a um, MOU. This was based off of the MOU for the school resource officer from the uh, Kootenai County Sheriff's Department. Um, we did make some changes to this and so did the school district as far as uh, some of these different items. So under the purpose of the SRO program, uh, <coughs> it was stricken the section that says and identifying and counseling troubled youth thereby diverting them from the criminal justice system. Of course our SRO is not a counselor and does not have training. Um, so that's why that was stricken out. Um, under the SRO obligations, um, there was a statement about teaching curriculum units. Um, and again, our SRO is not a, a teacher, he's a law enforcement officer. Um, but they are to have uh, leading classroom presentations and presenting assemblies covering topics that are developmentally appropriate for students in attendance. Uh, so there is that educational piece there. Again, in B on page two of the MOU, we took out counseling. Uh, in C, uh, pointed out that this uh, SRO will be in the elementary schools. Um, excuse me. Yes, sir. Um, can I assume that the strikeouts are what he deleted and the uh, highlight in yellow is what we added? Yes, correct. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, we have assignments uh, will be included it was to be included in the SROs regular uh, sorry to be included in the duties but we wanted to adjust the SROs regularly scheduled hours so that any of these different types of assignments would not create overtime um, for the SRO um, into the city obligations, this uh, patrol officer, uh, there is one edit in here that is not highlighted that I'll point out. Uh, we state that it will be at John Brown Elementary and Betty Kiefer Elementary. That was not part of the county's sheriff's department's MOU. Um, oh, gotcha. So uh, it does talk about what the uh, SRO will work primarily doing. Um, and all of those different things that uh, will be going on with the SRO. Um, they have to be trained, uh, they have to, the, the city will fill in the SRO if there's, a, you know, if he goes on vacation or something to that effect <coughs> so that there's coverage available. Um, there are some uh, the district obligations. We struck out the words that they'll provide textbooks and relating curricula and materials because they're not going to be teaching. Um, they, uh, there is going to be an office there. They will have a phone there in that office if needed. Um, so the big, big difference, of course, we did it in the consideration, the 65%, that is in line what they will be paying, 55000 uh, and eighty-four dollars and thirteen cents, and they'll be getting, uh, they'll be making payments of ten monthly installments of the five thousand five hundred and eight dollars and forty-one cents. I get my apologies for not highlighting that, but that is a change from the uh, Kootenai County Sheriff's MOU because we wanted it to address what our costs were uh, in that area. Uh, the big part here is we changed up the wording on these. Uh, sections here that the agreement shall be amended for consideration and renewed annually unless terminated in accordance with section C of this section uh, and the reason for that is there will be if there's pay increases for that officer then we want the consideration of the increase of pay to be modified um, and then we did take out the at any time verbiage in the termination of this it so if both entities believe that it's time to stop this, then they can do that. But if one entity wants to stop it, there has to be a one-year written notice. 
okay, uh, to do that. And then the other item of change um, was down in the information sharing. This actually happened after we first sent it out to the city council. So I'm highlighting it in, in the blue. Um, this is about uh, information sharing. This is actually something that I found out that the county wanted to put in here and the school district. We didn't know what this meant. So when we asked for clarification, they said, well, that's what the county wanted to put in. So uh, you can take it out. So we were taking that out. Um, Good move. Okay. And then it's, it's up for the signatures of, of uh, the board chair, uh, Dr. Meyer. Uh, the mayor and also the police chief for signatures. So that is the MOU that's here and then Lisa's here too if there's any questions that uh, the council wanted to address on the MOU for the school resource officer. Council, questions? I do have a question. Yes, sir. Two questions. Um, in C there is um, that this is specifying that this is for the elementary schools. Which C? Oh, I can't. Um, page two. Probably for me. My question for me. <laughs> we'll go over, okay. Lisa. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> well, we agree on this. So uh, we think that they need to be with the younger kids. He will go to the high school if needed and go and make appearances, but we want him with the younger kids. Like the dare. Yes. We do so dare. We, had, we agree on that, so that's why we want him down there. Okay. I agree. And then. Um, you don't feel that this is restricting you to certain, it, you don't feel that this language is too restrictive to hold you to just the elementary school that doesn't provide you opportunities to um, to be more broad, I guess? Um, we, well, we talk and he can go up there. School and community. He can go up there anytime he wants, but I don't want him to be up there this is oh, kind of an out. Say the high school principal wants him up there all the time. She can say, oh, okay. And then my other question that I had was regarding um, the, the terms of renewal and termination. Um, the disagreement shall remain in effect for the 2021-2022 um, public school fiscal year, um, but that the agreement shall be amended for consideration and renewed annually unless terminated. Oh, okay, so, so the agreement will be updated annually mm -hmm. but it will remain in effect for multiple years yes. and so then the termination um, in writing that it requires a one year what, what is considered one year one physical year is yeah so if they did it uh, January 1 then it's one year from January 1 if they did it May 1 then it's it gives us a full year to determine what we're going to do with that police officer whether we're going to keep him on staff or whether or not we you know, have to lay off a police officer in order to do that. But it gives us that full ability to do that. Um, but we get notice. Okay. May, I, may I address that question? Um, I would anticipate that uh, we would make those, uh, that decision at the end of our school year, mm -hmm. um, which is prior to your budget. Um, uh, process and also prior to ours so that then we have a year a full year as Leon just said but um, I don't I would not anticipate that the school district would come to you in in January or February um, with the termination request that it would be at the end of the school year. The, um, one other question not regarding the MOU but regarding staffing this position is this a seniority bit of appointment how, um, do, you, how do you staff the position? Well, Hudson here, I'll put him on the spot. He's been doing it for us. That's why he's here. He's excited. And um, we'll just move him into it. And <laughs> <laughs> well he wants to do it, which is a plus, because you don't want to put someone in there who doesn't want to do it. It won't work. Mm -hmm. It won't work. So he wants to do it. He's excited to do it. He has already been in the schools. The teachers and principals love him. So he will go into the spot, and we'll have to replace him. So is that by appointment or by seniority? It's by a picking. It's a good appointment. Okay. Thank you. I have a question about uh, HC, the termination, one year termination. Yes. So in, in June is when you make your decision, but you can't say, you know, you, you can say in June we don't want him anymore, but we will still provide it for that one year. Correct. And we would continue. So the way this, work, this reads, it's at the end of 
this year, which is not going to happen, but let's pretend. Just pretend. At the end of this year, we have some big budget issue, and we're, we're saying we can't continue this expenditure for the long term. We would then put in writing to the city that at the end of the 22-23 school year, this would be terminated. So there would be a year um, for the city to do as uh, Leon mentioned, um, do some planning with regard to your personnel. Okay. And you're, you're fine with that? Mm -hmm. School district sign. And you're fine with it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, two. Maybe one other question. Has this MOU been approved by the school board? They know it's coming. They, they have, um, they waited for the county to, to uh, approve prove it on there and before they approve it, they know this is coming in it and it will be approved. They've had an opportunity to review it? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. So it's sound? I'm sorry, I think it's uh, the other computer beeping. <coughs> Any other questions? No. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I would like to make a motion to authorize the mayor to sign the uh, MOU agreement with the Lakeland School District for the School Resource Officer. I'll second, second that. Motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? Sherry, please. Darrell Rickard. Aye. Paula Laws. Aye. Michael Hill. Aye. Stephen Adams. Aye. Motion passes. All right. Uh, the Reader Digest version of staff reports. Uh, 11 8. Was that the abridged uh, version? Um, well, it's August. Up the ready. microphone. Well, I thought you might get mad. It could be two seconds to get up there. really <laughs> 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 uh, We did. Um, <laughs> what did we do Tuesday, Saturday, August? And hey, Don't give us that whole PowerPoint thing again. Okay, well, we went and had a booth. They do it every year. And at the fair? Like, no, 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 down at, um, blank. Jobs fair? No, it's, no. uh, come out and meet all the cops and everybody down there in Haiti. So Coffee we did that. Uh, Coffee, Coffee with a cop? Nope, that's coming. <laughs> and then, uh, but you want this quick, so let's just, uh. Let's say you had a meeting. We did meeting. something in Haiti. Just like, <laughs> give out the no cones. You National got, Night Out. You got a new song. Oh, National Night Out. National Night Out. Uh, we're Night working on a candy machine. Um, school's going to start, so we're going to try doing, um, some extra patrol in front of the schools and get people to slow down before school starts. So I don't know if I get energetic, I might you might see me in the crosswalk all day long. Don't tell people that it's me and making stops and stuff. Don't, you know, don't get run over. Get in, get yeah, in the so ready to slow down. Uh, yeah. Since you pressured me, I think that's all I have right now. I think now. everybody knows you. We don't have to tell them. <laughs> no, they still have speed. I've only been almost hit like five times. But we don't that's, a, that's a quick version. We don't want you hit. Period. Finance reporting. Okay, I'm going to make this. What did you say? Okay. Oh, quick. Um, the staff report that you have in your packet is pretty self explanatory. I don't want to take up too much time. Um, the statement of revenues were looking really good um, for where we're sitting in July. Revenues have came in really well, higher than anticipated, which is awesome. Um, moving down, expenses are just exactly where I would expect them to be at this time of the year, um, at, towards the end of the budget year. Um, keep going. Keep going. Um, these are our um, an overall report of our funds. Um, again, we talked about the ones that say restricted, which can only be spent on things um, that they were attained for. This isn't just money lying around. Um, if you please move down. Water asset, um, there's our bank accounts. Um, keep in mind the repo sweep, we did move $2.5 million out of that fund into uh, the city hall fund, the diversified bond bank fund. So that will show up on the next report that you see next month. And that's my report for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Any questions? No. Oh, sorry. You Thank you, Melissa. Go on. your problem. <laughs> City Administrator. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, <laughs> and working on a lot of things for the city. You're the guy that put the two-hour limit on, just so uh, you remember. He's going. Um, there was a notice that came out, and I would recommend that the city council reads it from the AIC. There was a letter that came out from the house uh, leadership about reducing property taxes with the federal money. Uh, might I point out, as I did during the budget 
presentation, those funds are restricted. We can't use it to offset property taxes. The 900000 that we received can only be used for infrastructure projects. The good news is, is why we would refer it to if we put in a sewer line, expanded sewer line all the way down to Post Falls, that would reduce the fees that citizens would have to pay in the future. But it's not going to reduce property taxes. Uh, the funding that we got last year, the 600 and some thousand dollars that we received last year, that re did reduce property taxes. So please take that, those verbiage that they sent out with a grain of salt because it's incorrect. Um, you cannot use it for revenue replacement. Um, with that, they have a property tax meeting on Friday. Um, I might add, I looked at the looked for an agenda last week because it's time for those interim committees to start meeting. Um, there was no meeting scheduled, and then today I looked, and they've got a meeting scheduled for Friday. So I will be unable to attend that because I already have some prior commitments with my family. But I would imagine that they'll start posting those or make mention of the next meeting at the end of their meeting on Friday and I'll be able to stay attract, uh, up to speed on that and be able to attend those meetings as uh, possible. This one will be recorded so I'll be able to sit for half of my day watching the YouTube version of this meeting. So um, I'll, I'll get up to speed on that next week and get ready to attend the next uh, property tax hearing uh, meeting. Um, other than that, uh, that's it, unless you have any questions. Questions? <laughs> no. Now we're on a roll. glasses, we can keep going here. Uh, Mayor's report and appointments. I actually have a proclamation that we'll put on the record tonight. It will be given on 9-11 out here in front of Main Street. Right up to in front of the City Hall. Council report, Stephen. Nothing. Cheryl. Well, I... Nothing. Paula. Well, I heard today that they've canceled Hoop Fest, so yes. I'm so sad over that. Did they that. really? Yep. Yeah, Just now. Okay. Yeah. And if you okay. register, you only get 20% of your entry fee back. Yep. So anyway, I just thought, I thought that was sad. But so they're keeping the money? What do you mean? Oh, man. No, really. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, I only get... Um, <laughs> I think I read today, so I'm, I'm going to take another turn here, that the fire restrictions are coming off. Is that, did anybody else heard that? Friday. Mm -hmm. As of Friday, yeah. Wow, so, I'm surprised. Yeah. That's good news for those guys who would like to go camping at least one time this summer. Like you? <laughs> yeah, like me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> some of the lakes are poisoned. Seeing no Wait, further... Did you mind? Oh, oh, yeah, I did. You said no. Okay. <laughs> See, <laughs> thanks for the help, though. It's been a long night. <laughs> I'm just watching out for you. <laughs> uh, seeing no further city business before us tonight, without objection, we're here. Good night. Thank Irene. you, guys. Good job, Mayor. I think everybody's stumbled. You know when you rush me, ouch. What? I didn't know you were going to get a brain freeze. My God. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody helped me out. Nobody. Making split decisions. All these people. Oh, I guess I was wrong.